Well, I'm up against Samuel Ryshevsky, one of the greatest players ever, period. There we go, the move that I expected. I will be able to play the Queen's Gambit just as I expected. No surprise here, Ryshevsky is a very classical player. I'll take his pawn, let him get it back. I've got to get my pieces out, too. Well, this is nice. I don't have to worry about that pawn getting to e4. And the bishop at c1 is blocked in. Ah, here's my little surprise. This isn't the move that's usually played. More often, black moves the e-pawn forward and brings the bishop out toward the queen side or puts it at e7. I'm going to use a fianchetto plan, hoping that he won't be familiar with it. Of course he grabs the pawn. I fianchetto the bishop. Both sides get castled, and the knight comes out. Now I'm going to use an idea patented by the famous Russian world champion Vasily Smyslov. I bring this knight back to d7 so that it can swing over to b6 and attack white's bishop. My king is so safe that I don't have to worry about any attack, at least for the moment. Well, I rather expected this move too because it was played in an old Smyslov game. The other possibility I had to be ready for is the centralizing move e4, in which case I would have followed the game Evans versus Smyslov from the 1952 Helsinki Olympiad, which continued with an attack on the bishop, an attack on the knight, and a nice developing move. This game turned out well for black, so Ryshevsky opted for the standard move, queen to e2. I carry out my plan, going after the bishop, it retreats, and now I decided to play the new move that I had prepared. Previously, black had gone on a queenside attack with the a-pawn, but it didn't work out too well. So, I bring out my other knight, so that I'm almost fully developed, and my idea is to aim eventually to bring my pawn from e7 to e5. Ryshevsky aims his rook against my queen, but I have plans to move her out of the way soon. I can't resist the opportunity. I have to pin White's knight to the queen. So, Ryshevsky offers me a choice. Retreat, or give up the bishop for the knight. I had already prepared this line at home, and I knew that I was going to capture that knight. I wasn't sending the bishop off on some silly errand. Now comes the move that I had been hoping to play. I want to get my pawn to e5, but if I do that now, it won't work out very well. Notice that my queen is attacked. It turns out that this plan was used 20 years later in a game played in Czechoslovakia. Black got creamed. So, I can't move the pawn immediately. But now, with my queen tucked out of the way, I'll be able to do that. I was very pleased with this position. In fact, sometime later, I would repeat it against the very player, Svetozar Gligorich, who had studied 
this game against Ryshevsky before our encounter. Ryshevsky goes after the fork. Perhaps he considered that I was a young player and might overlook it. Gligorich later improved greatly by centralizing the knight at e4, and that discouraged me from repeating this opening for a bit. But knight b5 was what I was hoping for. I defend the pawn, and I know that I will be able to chase the knight away from b5 very easily using my pawn. Get out of here. Hmm. The knight goes back to the side of the board. Now, I realize that it can later come to c4, but at this point, I looked at the board and I dreamed about my bishop at g7 somehow getting to white's pawn at b2. This would be part of my eventual winning plan. Right now, however, I'm concentrated on getting the pawn to e5. I'm not quite ready yet, because if I really want to attack, I want to use pawns at e5 and f5. But I can't move the f-pawn because it's pinned. All right, let's break the pin. And besides, I might just be able to use the g-file to attack white's king. Okay, it's not going to be easy, but still, it's a real possibility. Ryshevsky plays the natural move, completing his development and putting a lot of pressure at c6. However, it's time for me to finally carry out my plan. There we go. If white takes my pawn, I'll take back with the knight and attack the queen, or take back with the bishop and go for b2. Both of those would be fairly complicated, but there's no reason for Bashevsky to walk into such complications, and instead, he decides to kick my knight out of the way. Well, this didn't bother me at all, because now the bishop at b3 looks kind of more like a tall pawn than a real bishop. It has nothing to do. I could retreat my knight, but first, yes, we, we attack the enemy queen. And by the way, now my bishop can go from g7 to b2. And if I get there, I'll be attacking both the knight and the rook. Looks like I'm close to winning. Ah, complications. My knight at c6 is still under attack. I'm sure he expects me to move it. But then I'm going to lose my pawn at c7. Is there anything better? Let's see. Part of my plan is to use my bishop to take the pawn at b2, but I still have my eye on white's king sitting at g1. I really wish that the g-file we're open. It's got too many pawns in the way. I know. I'll get rid of one. Aha! Betty didn't expect this. The look on his face was quite impressive at this point. I know that he didn't expect this move. What could this be all about? I'm sacrificing a pawn which is supposed to be defending my king? At this point I had already seen the coming combination, but Ryshevsky playing rather quickly, boldly decided to accept the pawn instead of retreating his queen. Oh, perhaps he thought I'd go after the pawn at b2 now, or do something about my attack knight. No, no, no. We have to look carefully at all the possibilities. I could, for example, offer an exchange of queens by bringing my queen to e5. Then if he takes, I could take back with the knight. Getting the queens off might be a good thing to do against such an accomplished player as Ryshevsky, but, you know, I have better ideas. How about I try to win his queen instead? Let's just take the knight and move it to e5. Not in order to save the knight, but to get my attack going. 
Now my knight might head to d3, or quite possibly to f3 with check. If Reshevsky did something foolish now, such as move the g-pawn forward, I'd be able to fork his king and queen. Well, he's not likely to fall for that, and oh no, he's pinned me. He's pinned me. Now if I move my knight into d3, he'll checkmate me. Ooh, strong player. But, you know, when you're fighting the chess battles, you have to look for every opportunity to attack the enemy king. And I saw one and grabbed it. At first, this move came as quite a shock. Ryshevsky actually did a little double take when I played it. It quickly turned into a frown, because he was caught and he knew it. He must accept the sacrifice, because otherwise I'll take his queen. There goes his bishop. But he can't take it back. If he takes back the bishop, he'd lose his queen. So, in order to get ready to recapture the bishop, he gets his king out of the way. Now he probably expected me to capture the pawn at b2. After all, that looks very strong. But I could smell the blood in the water. And since the bishop guards the checking square at f6, I decide that I should knock his queen around a little bit. Well, his queen came back. Now, if my queen were at h3, it would be a very, very strong position. So, he can have my bishop at c3. I'm aiming for that little pawn. There we go. Well, of course, he did not take the bishop, because if he did, I'd capture the pawn with check. His only legal move would be to bring the queen back. I'd capture the other pawn with check. And now he would be forced to interpose his queen and then checkmate. So, he went and defended the pawn. Now the h-pawn is defended, but the f-pawn is free. I don't capture it immediately, but threaten to take it with check with my queen. Again, he's in deep trouble, because I threaten checkmate in two moves after taking the pawn. So he must stop the checkmate, which he does, and now after all this time I simply grabbed the pawn at b2. To be honest, I thought he would resign at this point, uh, but Ryshevsky did not have a reputation for being the most uh, pleasant of opponents, and uh, he was certainly not going to resign to a 17-year-old kid, uh, even though the position is utterly lost for white. We continued on a bit with by capturing his pieces. I threaten another checkmate at g2, so he's got to let the queens come off the board. Well, now I'm up material. I'm up a whole piece. I have a rook and a pawn, and he's only got a bishop. Uh, I've got a big attack still. His uh, queenside pieces are utterly useless. Instead of resigning, he played on, and just for the record, here are the remaining moves. Um, they aren't very interesting but it just shows you, uh, well, how some players refuse to give up. Uh, this is not uh, a position which requires a great deal of work. I'm going to make a new queen with my c-pawn, but uh, he's got more problems than that. He's pinned, and if he takes my knight with his bishop, it's uh, such an easy win. He decide to keep some pieces on and try to use the king. But here come my queenside pawns. 
and there go his queenside pawns. Finally, Ryshevsky gave up. 